Well, thanks, Joe, for the introduction. And uh, I want to thank Ch Joe and Greg Miller for inviting me to participate with you and share uh, my experience of, being, of uh, having been working such a big, for us in Panama, it's a huge project, the most important, largest project, uh, infrastructure project ever built. So we have an hour and we have a lot of material to cover, so we might as well just jump into the presentation right away. Okay, the plan today, I will briefly talk about the history of the canal, how was, uh, and, and I mean the history going back to the 16th century. Uh, then we will discuss a little bit about the Panama Canal and how the Americans did the works in the early 20th century. And then we will jump into the expansion program and focus really into the third set of locks contract, which was the largest of the contracts of the Panama Canal expansion program. Uh, we will talk about the concept, uh, the tender process, some of the highlights of the contract, uh, its current status and the situation with the claims. And we'll conclude with uh, how, the, how the things are looking forward and some of our conclusions and lessons that we learned in this project. Okay, the history. The Panama Canal history goes back to the 16th century when the Spaniards meaning Charles V, the king of Spain, he came with the idea of cutting a path across Panama in order to uh, reduce the travel distance between Spain and their colonies in South America, mainly Peru, when they were moving all the gold back from Peru to Spain. Unfortunately, at that time, they didn't have the technology, and the, um, and the, land, uh, the, and the link it was just a land link that was built between the Atlantic coast of Panama and Panama City. And this land link was used all the way till the middle of the 19th century, when in 1850, the US government negotiated a concession agreement with the Colombian government to build the first transcontinental railroad, which by the way is still in operation today, is under concession by uh, Kansas City Southern Railways, operates this line. Now the French, in 1869, the French tried to attempt the same thing they did in Suez to build a canal. Unfortunately, they were not successful. They completely underestimated the project. They didn't have the proper planning. Uh, and they found very harsh uh, conditions in Panama. Panama was not what they found in Suez, where they found a flat terrain, sand, dry conditions. In Panama, it was broken terrain, uh, lots of landslides, lots of rain. And then you add to that the tropical diseases. So after. Uh, almost 10 years of uh, construction, they completely shut down the project in 1889 after spending over $235 million when they had a, an original budget for the whole project of $120 million. Now the United States, they also had an interest in the canal. In 1869, Ulysses Grant ordered expeditions to Mexico, Nicaragua, and Panama to start studying different alternative and routes to see if a canal was feasible. 1899 to 1903, Spanish-American War, the US really realized that they needed to own a facility in, um, in Latin America, in the, in the Central American Isthmus. Uh, when they had the issue of the sinking of the USS Maine in the Havana Bay, they had a lot of problems relocating some of the vessels, and they knew they, they needed to find a way to move their vessels faster. So in 1903, after failing to negotiate an agreement with the Colombian government, which at that time Panama was part of Colombia, uh, the group of rebels in Panama that were fed up with the Colombians, they negotiated with the US and the US assisted them in declaring independence from Colombia. So that was the reason Panama was born as a country. So in 1903, a treaty gets signed between the US and Panama, the Haibunova Barilla Treaty, which allows the US to take a five mile strip of land on each side of the waterway and it will be under control uh, of the United States at perpetuity. Uh, the US only paid $10 million to the government of Panama with an annuity of $250 uh, every year. Now Panama was not pleased with this deal and we'll mention later what happened here. So between 1904 and 1914, the US builds the canal spends $375 million doing this project, of which uh, included in that number, it's $40 million the US paid the French, uh, the French company to acquire its assets, and then they also paid the $10 million to the Panamanian government. 
Over 75,000 workers uh, work in this project with casualties around 5,600. Now, as mentioned, the Panamanians were not happy with this deal. Uh, Mr. Bruno Varilla, a Frenchman that had a lot of connections with the U.S. Congress, uh, he arranged for the deal of the independence of Panama. But his real interest was not the independence of Panama. He was more concerned about selling the assets of the French company, being uh, him part of that, that company. So, uh, as mentioned, Panama then, the Panamanians felt that we had a country inside our country. I mean, this 10-mile strip of land right in the center of Panama, with its own laws, its own regulations. Uh, Panamanians could not get in that zone any time. To get there, it was difficult. You even have to have a special driver's license to drive in the canal zone. So with all these problems, Panama started negotiating agreements with the US uh, to get easier, the things easier in the canal zone. But the local Sonians, they were, they were non-compliant with all these agreements. So in January 9, 1964, what, what is called in Panama the Martyr's Day, a group of students walk into the canal zone to exercise their right of on a previous agreement to raise a Panamanian flag in the zone. Now they were met by the Sonians and a riot erupted which ended up with 22 Panamanian students killed uh, after the intervention of the U.S. Army. So this situation really opened the eyes of the Latin American countries that really started pushing and helping Panama to get this canal back. So in September of 1977, the Torrijos Carter Treaty gets signed, which, which allows for the transferring of the Panama Canal and the Canal Zone to the Republic of Panama, with its implementation starting in 1977 and with the complete transfer on December 31st, 1999. That was the day Panama took complete control of the facility. Now, as mentioned, the, the story is long, and if you want to read more about it, I would recommend you to read that book. It's a very, very good book for you guys that are into construction. I would really recommend it. Now, the Panama Canal. What did the U.S. did, and why, why, why did they want to do it? And, and if you see that, that map that pretty much tells you the story. A boat from New York to San Francisco will take about 13,000 miles on this voyage. If you go across Panama, you'd reduce it by more than half to 5,200. So you save a lot of time and money. So that was the, what was behind it. So how the project, the U.S. envisioned the project. Right here in central Panama, you have a very important river called the Chagres. So the U.S. the U.S. dammed the Chagres here on the Atlantic coast of Panama, <coughs> and this dam created Gatun Lake, which is a lake that is used today to uh, to move the ships across Panama, and it's a lake that is 27 meters above sea level. So you needed to get the ships from the ocean up into the lake. So locked structures had to be built here on the Atlantic, one lock complex, and two lock complexes on the Pacific side. Now the lake you had to link with the Pacific side of Panama, uh, since the central reach of Panama moved this way. So an excavation project took place here for the Galear Cut, which uh, is commonly known as the Big Ditch that runs from here. And this is how the canal looks after it was completed. That's where your Gatun Dam is with the Gatun Locks, the Pedro Miguel and Miraflores Locks in the Pacific side, and the Galear cut right here, it's Culebra cut as it's called in Spanish. The main features of the canal, you have your three lock complexes. Uh, the Gatun lock complex in the Atlantic that has three chambers. The Pedro Miguel and the Miraflores on the Pacific side. <coughs> the Gatun dam that controls the Chagres River and also created Gatun Lake. Uh, the Gatun Lake which is the main body of water and the Galear Cut that links, it's an eight mile ditch that links the Gatun Lake and the Pacific Locks. Now in 1935, uh, a dam was built upstream on the Chagres called Madem, and it was built to, pro uh, to fl uh, control flash flooding and also to add additional storage of water. Since the canal, uh, what fits the canal is rainwater, so we need to store as much water as possible. And I think this graph pretty much explains this uh, in a simpler way how it works. You have your three chambers on the Atlantic side here. 
you transit the vessel across the Gatun Lake, you go down one step on Pedro Miguel, you transit then across Miraflores Lake, a very small lake, and then you got two more steps on the Pacific side of Miraflores, and then you transit out into the Pacific Ocean. Uh, and here are some pictures. That's the Gatun Dam seen uh, downstream of the Chagres. That's the Miraflores Locks on the Pacific side where you can appreciate the two chambers here, one and two. That's the Pedro Miguel Lock, which only have one chamber. And here you can see the beginning of the Galear Cut. That's the Gatun Lock where you have three chambers. That's on the Atlantic side, the three chambers. And that's the Gale Yard Cut that goes across the central reach of Panama, the eight, eight mile long uh, ditch. Uh, Gatun Lake, where the vessels transit. And Madden Dam. Now, the size of the lock when it was built back in, in the early 20th century, the US selected the size of 1,000 feet long by 110 feet wide and 42 feet high. Now, any idea why the U.S. selected this size? Anyone wants to take a guess? What was the ship that was the, the vessel that was required for this facility to move? You're right. <laughs> That's the USS Iowa. You see that it barely fits the lock. <laughs> Remember, when the U.S. built this facility in the early 20th century, it was uh, for strategic military reasons, not for commercial reasons. Okay, some other facts. It's, uh, the canal is 51 miles long. It takes about eight hours to transit on a vessel. Uh, we get an average of 40 ships per day and around 12 to 15,000 uh, ships per year. The average toll on the, on the canal is about $150,000 with the highest toll paid on the old facility uh, or the original canal of $375,000. Now, the Panama Canal Expansion Program. Okay, the, pa the, ca the canal expansion program really started back in 1939. It's not a new concept. Uh, the U.S. started this project basically because they needed to move larger military vessels, meaning aircraft carriers. But the project was shut down uh, during World War II, uh, and the U.S. really didn't push for any more expansions after the war. Now, in 1980, a commission called the Tripartite Commission, which was made from the United States, Japan, and Panama, started studying what to do with the canal. And they concluded that a third set of locks was needed in order to increase the canal capacity in the future. Now, in the 1980s, Panama was at rift with the U.S. because of the Noriega situation, and also we were in the middle of the transferring of the facility, so really not much was what really happened after the Tripartite Commission came with its conclusion. So it was all the way till the Panama took over of the facility in the early 21st century that the Panama Canal Authority, the ACP, uh, in its master plan came with the same conclusions that an expansion was needed. Now the Panama Canal is such an important asset to the Republic that we have a, a chapter, a special chapter in our constitution that deals with the canal. And this chapter state that once we receive the facility, if Panama wanted to expand it, it had to go to a national vote. So in October of 2006, a national referendum took place and the Panamanian people, a vast majority, decided that yes, we needed to go for the project. So why did it need to expand? And why it was so important to Panama? The canal and all the related businesses, meaning port facilities, uh, ship services, lawyers, insurance, banking, represents about 27% of our GDP. So if the canal, we didn't make it bigger and efficient, it will hit very, very hard our economy. Uh, it was estimated in the early 2000s that by 2020, uh, I mean, at that time, by 2014, 2015, we were gonna reach uh, full capacity. Now, due to the situation and the financial crisis of 2008, uh, this date had to be pushed to 2020. Now, if we, once we reach capacity, the only way to increase the revenues is tied by increasing the tolls. And it could reach a point that the tolls might be so high that the shipping lines will look for alternate, alternate routes instead of using Panama, being one of the routes, the Suez Canal, which is a direct competitor of Panama. So Panama embarked in this project. 
It's a $5.25 billion project. It might seem not as a big project compared to some of the projects we, you have seen here in the United States, but for an economy with a $55 billion GDP, that's a lot of money. So we embarked on the project. Uh, the project was funded using tolls, uh, really Panama, the Republic of Panama di didn't really get much uh, debt onto this contract. Uh, it was the ACP that took the task of using its toll and it also asked for some funding from external banks for about $2 billion to fund the project during the peak construction period. Now, the numbers show that the loan was go is gonna be repaid in about eight years with a yield of 12%. So it seems a very good business for Panama. Okay, what's the project? It includes several uh, pieces. One and the most complicated is the new lock complexes in the Pacific and Atlantic side. Uh, a Pacific access channel, which is a link between the south end of the Galear cut and the new locks at the Pacific side. Uh, improvements, meaning widening and deepening of the existing channels on the ocean side and also inside Gatun Lake, since we're gonna be moving larger vessels with more draft. And also, because we needed more water, we're increasing the, we're raising the Gatun Lake level by one and a half feet. Now you need to understand that the lifeline of the canal is wa it's water. We manage water. We get water from rainfall, we store it in a lake, and then we waste this water into the ocean when we move ships. So we have to make sure that we get more water coming into the lake than what we're wasting into the ocean. With a new lock, we'll be wasting more water and there's some provisions to assist with that which we'll explain later in the presentation. So the new locks will be here, right here on the same side in Cologne, in Gatun side, uh, I mean in the Atlantic side, and then other new locks will be built here in the Pacific side. Uh, you see the Gatun locks and adjacent we we're building the new facilities here and a new access channel, it's a very short channel and then on the Pacific side, beside the Miraflores and Pedro Miguel, we have the new lock here, and the new Pacific access channel, which is about six kilometer long. So that, that was a big excavation contract. <coughs> now, we will talk about the third set of locks contract, which was the key component of the project, the $3.2 billion contract that we work on. Okay, f most important thing, that Panama was thinking when got in the project, what was the lock size? Which was the size? As mentioned before, the US in nineteen in early 20th century picked up the size of the lock based on the size of the USS battleship. So now that Panama is running the operation, we're, we're doing it on a commercial basis. So we need to see which ships were giving us the most revenue. So they find out that the Panamax container ship, which is a vessel that carries between 3,400 and 4,500 TEUs, and a TEU being your typical 20-foot container, what was the ship that was producing the most revenue? Uh, in 2015, 24% of the ships going across the canal uh, were container vessels, Panamax vessel, but they were representing about 48% of the income. So that was the ship that Panama used to size the new canal. Now the tendency of the shipping uh, lines is to increase the vessel sizes uh, towards larger vessels, 12,000 to 18,000 TEU vessels, monster ships. And if we didn't increase the size of the canal by 2020, only 32% of the vessels, container vessels, will be able to pass across Panama. So we were gonna become obsolete and probably most of these shipping lines will start moving through Suez. So the ship model we selected, the new, what is called today the Neo Panamax that will fit the new locks, is a vessel between 12,500 and 13,500 TEU, which those size 1,200 feet long and about 160 feet wide. And with the expanded canal, by 2020, we will be able to handle 80% of the world uh, container vessels. So that will keep the canal competitive for a few years more. So the new chamber, the new dimension, 1,400 1, feet long, 180 feet wide, and 60 feet deep. Uh, there's gonna be on each uh, location three chambers. Now, as mentioned again, uh, 
previously mentioned, water, water is key, import, it's very important. These new locks, they use three times more water than the old chambers. So we introduced the use of water saving basins, a concept that has been used in Europe, where we recycle about 60% of the water on a transit. Uh, the, origin, the old canal uses about 55 million gallons of water on each transit. The new canal uses 51 million gallons of water. Now, this, this log uses three times more water, but we're saving 60% of the water. And here's a comparison of the two locks, how of the two chambers. You see uh, the 1,000 here against the 1,400 and 180 feet against the 110 feet, 42 feet high and 60 feet. So we can fit the bigger vessels. And this is an how the water saving basin works. Uh, you get your, your vessel here on the chamber and the adjacent water saving basins. So the water moves from here to a set of culverts under, uh, under the locks and you start filling up your water saving basins. Each slot that, I, that it's marking here, it's 20% it's of the water on the chamber. So you pass your 60% from the chamber to the basins and the red remaining 40% is moved to the next chamber and eventually into the ocean. So once you move your vessel and you want to refill back your, water, your chamber, you move back the water from the water saving basins into the chamber. It's a very simple process. It's all by gravity. There's no pumps in this facility. And then you backfill with water from the lake. And we, as I mentioned, you use 7% less water when you use this system. Now, this, this system, it slows down the operation. If we have excess water in the lake, we can do the operation without the water saving basins. It will move the vessels faster. Uh, and we can do that sometimes during the peak rainy season in Panama. And that's a picture of the new locks. You see the three chambers here. That's on the Pacific side, the water saving basins. There's three basins per lock chamber. And here you can see the Pacific Access Channel, the six kilometer long channel linking the Galear Cut that started right there on the bridge, all the way here. And here's a picture of the, of the Atlantic Lock, the Agua Clara Lock. Similar structure, same size. Now the tender process, and that was the part I was really involved as a contractor in Panama. It was a long tender period. We started this process in August of 2007 with the, what was called the pre-qualification period, which ran between August of 2007 till December of 2007, in which ACP focused in pre-qualifying four bidders, which they were able to do in December of 2007. Immediately after the pre-qualification process was completed, ACP published its RFP, and the tender process took place between December 2007 and February of 2009. So it was about a year and a couple of months long period. It was a lot, we had a lot of meetings and a lot of things discussed. ACP wanted teams composed of three members. One, a design build contractor or contractors as a joint venture. Uh, they asked for a lot of experience and so it was very difficult to find one contractor that complied with everything ACP wanted. So all four teams that pre-qualified were joint ventures. Now, as part of the team, but not necessarily part of the joint venture, each team had to present a log, uh, project designer and also a log gate fabricator, being the log gates one of the key components of the project. Now, why this process took so long, over a year on the tender process? Now, this was the largest infrastructure project ever built in Panama, and the ACP it's, a it's, a, it's an operation that really does manage the canal, and they don't have much experience on this huge, large construction project. So for a year, we had a lot of meetings between the contractors and the ACP, discussing the tender documents, the contracts, et cetera. And in the beginning, we had a lot of meetings where all contractors will go into the meeting with the ACP, and no one really wanted to talk. I mean, contractors felt awkward to start telling the you know, their weaknesses and their strengths that they may have. So after a couple of meetings, ACP said, no, we will do individual meetings. So we all met on a confidential basis, each contractor with the ACP. And 
Also at this time, ACP was still doing testing, uh, seismic testing and geotechnical testing. And all of this information was being passed along to the contractors, so we were able to present a very good proposal. In the end, the RFP got amended during this period 24 times. Lots of changes on the contract documents. In the end, we were able to achieve a more balanced contract. The original RFP provided a contract that was very unbalanced. All of the risk was given to the contractor. So we were able to introduce uh, escalation clauses. We were, we were going to be recognized additional costs in case of uh, price differentials on diesel fuel, cement, structural steel, and labor, and also for adjustment in, uh, based on ch changes of legislation in Panama. Also, when we were bidding this project, we were in the middle of the financial crisis of 2008, so ACP also had to lower their standards on what they were asking for bonding, uh, which way they were able to cooperate, because some of the bidders were not going to be able to bid based on the original conditions on the bonding they were asking for. Uh, the selection criteria that ACP had, it was a best value approach. It was not a, it was not a low price, meaning that the low bidder with the lowest price may not necessarily get the award on the contract. So the score was composed of two components, a technical parameter of 55% and a financial parameter, parameter meaning the, the price, just 45%. So really, uh, ACP was more focused into the technical solution provided by each contractor instead of the price. As mentioned, there were four bidders uh, pre-qualified, and in the end, only three bidders presented a proposal. Uh, Grupo Unidos for Canal Joint Venture, the one I work with, uh, had the highest technical score at 4,088 points. And we also came in with the low price, which gave us the highest score on the price score. So that was the final number, 8,000 points, uh, compared to the second one, which was the Bechtel team, uh, American team with the Japanese companies which came with 6,700 uh, 6, points. The third team, Canal, was a team made of Spanish and Mexican companies, which came in third place. Now, you see there was a big difference on prices between the JV and the Bechtel price, about a billion dollars. But ACP was not that concerned, thinking that it was a risky proposal, as our pri their base price was about, three, uh, about $300 million. It was just about 10% when you look at the price. So ACP said it was, a, it was an acceptable, responsive bid. So that's how we got to sign the contract. Now, Grupo Unidos por el Canal is a team made of four uh, contractors. Uh, first one is a company called SACIR, based in Spain. Uh, at that time, we were bidding the project. They, they, they're a general contractor, but they had a very high uh, financial reputation. So they provided the financial strength at that time. Today, they are not in that situation. <laughs> <They are laughs> uh, the second group is a company based in Italy called Salini in Pregilo. They're a large construction company. They do a lot of hydroelectric power plants in South America, Europe, and in Africa. And I think they have some operations here in the United States. Uh, the third member of the team is Jan Denul. It's the largest dredging contractor. They're based, they're based in Belgium. They have a huge dredging fleet. But they also had experience building locks in, in Belgium and in Holland, and also m uh, handling the big lock gates. And finally, Constructora Urbana, that's the way you pronounce it, uh, CUSA, the company I work for, we are the local component. Uh, we were part of the team because of our knowledge of the area, knowledge of the client, and we are also an uh, excavation uh, contractor. We, and we manage some of the excavation contracts in this project. Also, there were the design team, which is called the International Consultant of the Panama Canal. It's a team led by Montgomery Watson Harsa. And there were two components, uh, two other team members. Uh, they had small, smaller share on the design, which was Tetra Tech. They were responsible for designing the water saving basins. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, they were doing this design right here in Seattle, their office in Seattle. And then Ivy Group, a company from the Netherlands, they were responsible for designing the lock gates. And finally, the lock gate fabricator, we hire a company based in Italy called Cimolai. They're a small company based, uh, they're close to Venice. But they were quite capable and they built all these 16 lock gates in Venice and they were shipped, transferred to Panama. Some of the uh, highlights of the work we did, 
in during the construction of the locks. Related to excavation, we moved close to 75 million cubic meters of material between excavation, fill, and dredging works. Uh, we pulled four close to 4.5 million cubic meters of concrete on both facilities. Uh, we use 195,000 tons of rebar, uh, cement, 1.2 million tons of cement were used, uh, and we produced 9.3 million tons of aggregate for concrete. <coughs> the 16 lock gates, each one weighing about, in average, about 4,000 tons. They are monster gates, they look like a small building. And then 152 valves were installed in both facilities, and these valves are used to manage the movement of water between the different chambers and also the water saving basins. Okay, the contract as mentioned, uh, $3.2 billion. Uh, ACP provided advance payment for $600 million. Uh, the bond that we have to place towards the client was a $400 million bond and a $50 million payment bond. Uh, ACP said liquidated damages at $300,000 per day with a cap of $54.6 million. Uh, but there was also an incentive and a bonus to finish the facility early. So ACP said that we'll pay $220,000 a day for each day we finish early with a cap of $50 million. Uh, we received a letter of acceptance or contract award on 15th of July of 2009, and the notice to proceed was given on 25th of August of 2009. We have 1,182 days to finish the project, which uh, completion date was set up in the contract at 20th of October of 2014. Now as Joe mentioned uh, facility opening 26th of June, so we were late. <laughs> and we will discuss that later. Uh, the contract agreement for guys that are into contracting, uh, it was a design-build contract. Uh, the model contract was included in the tender documents, and that was the document that was heavily amended during the process. It's based on the FIDIC Yellow Book Plant and Design-Build Contract. Uh, it's a standard contract document that is, uh, that is widely used in international construction. And the contract is governed by the laws of the Republic of Panama. <coughs> Dispute resolution, which is what we're into right now. The contract provides for three-step resolution process uh, for dispute <coughs> resolution. One being the first, you go to the, uh, to the employer, the ACP, and you present your claim with all the details, and then ACP decides if your claim has merit or not. And I would say that ACP pretty much said to all our claims, nah. <laughs> <laughs> then when once ACP said nah, then we had a second option. We went to what is called the DAB, the Dispute Adjudication Board, also known as the Dispute Review Boards, or DRB. It's a panel of three experts that were appointed at the beginning of the project, and they periodically visit the project about every six months and they will meet with both the contractor and the ACP and they will listen to s issues, what's happening and once we have a claim ready to go to them and after the employer had determined then they will listen to our claim and they will come with a binding uh, uh, ruling. Now if you are not happy what the DAB uh, produces then you got a third option which is international arbitration under the ICC rules with a venue in Miami, Florida. So what's the status today of the contract? The $3.2 billion contract today is around $3.7 billion. ACP had allowed for price adjustment of $120 million on the materials, $24 million on changes of legislation, uh, $19.4 million on labor rate adjustments. Uh, there were some small variations and certain fees that Grupo and ACP negotiated. But the big number today is the $331 million that Grupo has been able to obtain on claims from AC, uh, towards ACP. Uh, most of the money coming from this claim has been rulings from the DAB. Uh, now about the date, the original date of October 20, 2014, because of time extension had been moved to 20th May of 2015, but the functional completion on the day ACP took over the canal was the 31st of May of 2016, so we're still one year late, and that pretty much covers the $54.6 million of liquidated damages. 
Now, there's still ongoing dispute, so ACP has not charged yet this amount to Grupo. Now, this is the situation today with the estimated cost of the contractor. Remember, $3.7 billion. Any idea how much this is costing the consortium? Anyone who wants to take a guess? $5 billion. If you compare that to the $3.7 billion that Grupo had been paid, the joint venture, there's a $1.3 billion result, negative result. <laughs> now, this situation has generated about 113 claims, of which I would say 24 of these claims are the relevant ones for $3.5 billion. So we pretty much need to double that cost. Uh, we are also claiming on 952 days of time extension, uh, but the reality is that as, as of today, only 331 million have been recognized with time extension of 212 days. Now, why the claims? They basically relate to three things. Different site conditions, interpretation of the contract documents, and the validity of certain clauses of the contract under the laws of Panama. Now, the ongoing litigation doesn't allow me to talk much about what's happening with the claims. <laughs> but uh, I will briefly touch three of the main claims that are under discussion right now. Uh, the first two, the Pacific Cofferdam and the basalt and concrete mix claim, they're currently being here at the ICC. And then there's a third claim, the employer's disruption, which is the largest claim for $1.4 billion, is being right now been uh, analyzed by the employer, so it's a at, at a very early stage. Those three claims covered about <laughs> $2.1 billion of all the claims presented. Now the Pacific Cofferdam, what was the situation there? Uh, when Grupo made its plan to build the Pacific Lock, it envisioned to build a dam in order to be able to complete the lower chamber of the Pacific Lock. In this picture you can see here this is early 2010. Uh, the excavation works being started right here, and the projection of the lock will take the lower chamber right here into the ocean side. So the idea was to be it was to build this coffer dam here, so we could isolate this area from the ocean and dry it out, do the watering, and dry excavate this area. And this is a picture of how the cofferdam look after it was completed. You see the cofferdam here and the area here that we isolated. And the new chamber will go up to about here. So the execution plan, the idea was to build the dam, isolate the area for construction. Uh, the information provided by ACP said that we were going to be uh, looking for firm soils to set up the the foundation of the coffer dam at, at an elevation of minus six meters. Uh, once we build the coffer dam, we would the water and do the dry excavation. And doing the dry excavation was cheaper than actually dredging all that area and disposing this material on the ocean side. What happened and what was the reality? When we got there, we didn't find any hard soils at minus six. We found it at minus 14 meters. And the reason of that is that when the U.S. did the project, started the project in 1939, they had already dredged the area. And all the area was backfilled with maintenance dredging being done on the actual canal. Uh, but no one said that during the tender process. So we had to dredge the area instead of doing dry excavation and dispose all this waste material that was dumped in this area in the ocean side. So that became very expensive. Then second, since our foundation was deeper, we needed to move more dirt to build all this, all this coffer dam. So here, our claim is related to unforeseen physical conditions and more conditions more adverse than that was previously uh, indicated in the contract documents. And we are also claiming that the employer failed to disclose data. So the claim is currently the at the ICC. It's a hundred one hundred and ninety-four million dollar claim with a one hundred and twenty-day time extension. Now the DAB had previously ruled in favor of the ACP, saying that the cofferdam was outside of the construction area 
uh, I mean of the of the footprint of the locks, which the contract allow for claims for different site conditions only in cases that the situation was found in the footprint of the locks. Since this was outside of the footprint, they say no. They also said that Grupo could have changed the construction method and used an alternate method. And they also said that ACP, and ACP had put in the in their contract documents a lot of disclaimers about the validity of the information they provided. So they also said, well, if ACP had this disclaimer, they say no. Now, this is under dispute because uh, we believe that uh, the, the law of Panama doesn't allow for disclaimers like this to be put in contracts. So that's the reason this is at the ICC right now. Now, the second claim we'll, we'll discuss is the quality of basal and the concrete mix design. There are actually two claims here, but they were put together when it was presented at the DAB. And I think this is a very popular claim that uh, it was widely spread on the news when, when it happened, when it was ruled in, I think it was in early 2015, uh, December 31st, 2014. And it relates to the quality of the basalt that was used for production of aggregate and also on the approval of the mixed design, of the mixed design used for, uh, for the logs on behalf of the ACP. Okay. Grupo and actually all four contractors bidding the project relied on ACP's information about the quality of basalt that was going to come from the Pacific Locks excavation. Pretty much all the excavation from the Pacific Lock was going to be basalt. Uh, <coughs> so the idea was to excavate this material, have a crushing facility, produce all this material, and then use it on the concrete for Pacific Lock. And since we didn't have any good materials on the Atlantic side, we have to ship material through the Gatun Lake all the way to Colon, uh, the Atlantic coast of Panama, to do the concrete for the Atlantic log. Another incentive or, you know, another thing that led us to believe that it was this was the right thing to do is that ACP's cost estimate that they showed the Republic of Panama when they put this project in the national referendum said that the basalt for the project was going to come from the Pacific logs excavation. So when we got there and started digging this basalt from this pit, we found out that the material was unfeasible to be used for aggregate <laughs> production. I mean, we found spots that the material was good, that <coughs> could have been used for concrete, but the area had a lot of uh, fractures and faults, so we found a lot of weather material. So when we were excavating the locks, uh, we, had, we had a mix of good basalt and weather basalt and really the final production came up pretty bad material. So we had to discard all that basalt that we originally planned to use for concrete. We had to dispose it. And then we needed to find a new pit to open. And we found a source close by which produced material that was better, it was usable, but still <coughs> once we produced the, basalt, uh, the aggregate in the crushers, we were producing excess fines, uh, meaning material that's uh, below the 200 sieve and we had estimated that waste material coming from the production was going to be around 8%. We ended up wasting about 30%. So we had to do a more excavation to compensate for all this waste. So Grupo is claiming here that the additional excavation that we have to do to develop this new pit and also the additional excavation required to compensate for the loss we have on the fines and also Handling all this fine material that we have to wash during production, we need to find special places to dispose it, and we didn't have much space, so we had to truck all this material from the facilities we were producing to store it. Now, the concrete mix design, which is also part of this claim, uh, in the employer's requirement, or what ACP asked, they indicated in the documents that the concrete that we had to pour had to have a 100-year life durability and be resistant to chloride ion penetration as per the ASTM C1202 test. And they require that the charge passing on the concrete to be no greater than 1,000 coulomb as specified on their do documents. Now, it was very difficult to do the prediction so uh, on the 100-year durability. So ACP and the contractor GUPC agreed to use a uh, the software and test protocol developed by an independent consultant called Simco 
They're based in Quebec, Canada. And they have a system that will help you determine if the concrete was going to be durable for 100 years. So we both agreed to use their system. Okay, when we met with Simco, they show us one of their tests on their protocol included a modified test of the ASTM, ASTM C1202. And according to their test protocol, our concrete will last the 100 years. Now there was one problem. The concrete did not pass the 1000 Coulomb test. So for about six months, we spent fighting with ACP about what to do with the mix. And in the end, ACP said, you comply the, with the 1202. So we were forced to add silica fume into the mix, which required modification to the concrete batch plants and also created a lot of issues with the workability and how to manage this concrete. The concrete, we wanted to have a very soft fluid material to pump into the new locks. We ended up with this very stiff mix that it was very difficult to work with. So that really affected our production rates. <coughs> so here we're claiming delay and associated cost with the startup of the concrete works, the six months delay. Uh, the modification of the concrete plants and the silica fume we have to buy to include in the mix design. The loss of productivity due to the workability of the concrete mix problem. And also because the mix was so stiff and we were pouring this mix into uh, reinforced concrete, the finish on the surface was pretty bad. So a lot of repair ha work we had to do once we did all the, once we took off all the form work, we have to go repair a lot of the surfaces. About over one million square meters of surface was repaired. Now this claim is also at the ICC. Both Grupo, uh, GUPC and ACP took claims to the ICC for $577 million and 256 day time extension. Now the DAB on this claim had previously ruled partially in favor of GUPC, giving $235 million and a 176 day, day time extension. Now Grupo is claiming that they won the 577 as previously claimed, and ACP says that they don't want to pay anything. So we have the two claims right now at the ICC. And now the final, uh, uh, okay, the ruling on the DAB side, they said that it was clear that the employer had led the contractor to believe that the Pacific lock excavation material was going to be used for basalt. And they also said that just by complying with the 100 year durability test as per the Simco test, it was just enough information for Grupo to start pouring concrete. And the last claim we will mention briefly is the employer's disruption. It's a, to me, it's a very creative claim. We're claiming on the other claims. It's the effect that all the claims we presented have all combined. And this claim is for about $1.4 billion. It's just being presented to the employer and we're waiting for them to come with their determination, which it's obvious this claim will also end up at the ICC. Now looking ahead, it's obvious that we're going to have a lot of litigation. I say that probably we're going to spend more time in litigation than the time we actually had building this facility. Lawyers are going to make a killing. <laughs> they are the ones that are going to make the real money here. Uh, and obviously the contractor wants to mitigate its losses and hopefully will make a little bit of profit. Uh, the employer will defend itself. ACP is going to fight about it. They are a government agency and they have to stand up for their principles. A possible settlement, uh, it's been discussed, but I doubt it's gonna happen. Uh, ACP is a government agency and the people working there, they don't wanna take the responsibility of signing a settlement and then later being lawsuit or having trouble. So they, they rather have a tribunal saying, you pay. Now, everything is not bad. The project has been completed. Uh, by the end of fiscal year 2016 on ACP, which is September 30th, 238 vessels had transit across the facility and revenues or income has come in excess of $100 million. So the good thing is that the facility is working for the world and shipping lines every day are bringing more ships. The operation has started a little slow. They're moving between three to four ships per day. Since the pilots over there, they need to train on the new vessels and also the system 
they're using to move the vessels is different. The original locks, they have a system of uh, mules or rail cars that keep the, sh the ship aligned in the, in the lock. The new lock doesn't have that system. They have a system, uh, they use uh, tugboats. But as time progresses, they will increase the amount of vessels going. They expect uh, in a couple of months to have up to 12 vessels per day. Now, some of the lessons uh, that we learn, and also as, uh, as a contractor, first of all, you need to have balanced contracts. I mean, the moment you do the unbalanced contract, the way this was handled, you end up with the amount of claims that we have. W you need to know your client. And for those of you that, are, that will go into international contracting, don't ever underestimate where you're working. Uh, us being the Panamanian component, we always warn our European associates that ACP was a tough cookie to deal with. And they said, nah, we're gonna deal with a Central American country, that's a third world, uh, they don't know how to do things, we will teach them how to do things. Oh boy, they were surprised. They found a very highly motivated, educated, trained by the US Army Corps of Engineers <laughs> team <laughs> of experts. Also well advised by a US company called CH2M Hill that were advising the ACP. So, oh my God, Grupo was up for a surprise. <laughs> then also, you need to know your partners and stakeholders. When you get into these big, high, iconic projects, I mean, we as locals, we had all these companies showing up, ah, come work for our team, we will do such a great project. And once you get into the bid process, everything is rose color. <coughs> Not after you win the contract. After we won the contract, we, were, we had a lot of internal issues, the way we saw things. I say we have four companies with four different cultures, uh, different ways of doing things. Um, two companies, the larger ones were publicly traded companies, so the mindset was different of the other two smaller companies where were privately family owned companies. So that generated a lot of internal issues uh, when decisions had to be made which delay the process and obviously time is money. <coughs> you need to understand the legal implications, uh, basically jurisdictions. Uh, as mentioned, this was a contract under Panama law, but the contract documents were written by UK and American lawyers, which law system is based on common law and our system in Panama is based on civil law. So there's big chance that some of these uh, clauses in the contract may not be valid and this may help Grupo in the process of getting some of these claims. Also avoid litigations. We see the bills every month of the lawyers and they're outrageous and they keep piling up and every time they're bigger. So if you can settle and negotiate at a DAB level or even at the employer level, it's better for both sides. And one thing that I also learned is that you don't let the third parties, meaning consultants or lawyers, di dictate the terms. In the end, you are the responsible party to make the decision. You can use their advice, but at some, some point I feel that, sometimes I feel that the lawyers and the consultants are the ones running the show. And most likely their interest is not the same as the interest we have as contractor and as an owner. So really you have to do your homework when you get in something this big. And this basically, it's all the presentation. Thank you.